the night wind to the little land Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little land Do you see what I see? A star, a star Dancing in the night With a tail as big as a kite With a tail as big as a kite Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy Do you hear what I hear? Ringing through the sky, shepherd boy Do you hear what I hear? A song, a song High above the trees With a voice as big as the sea With a voice as big as the sea Said the shepherd boy to the mighty king Do you know what I know? In your palace warm mighty king Do you know what I know? A child, a child Shivers in the cold Let us bring him silver and gold let us bring him silver and gold. Said the king to the people everywhere, listen to what I say. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. A child, a child, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and life. He will bring us goodness and life. chapter, or 1 John chapter 4, in verses 10 through 12 is where our text is this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 through 12. We're talking about confident Christian living in the series that we've been on for several weeks. The confidence in how we live for Christ and how we endure, if you will, through this world is what we're trying to help us to understand. And today we're talking about confidence that we have in Christ, in our Christian walk, in God's love. As we operate in God's love for His purpose and allow Him to be exil to exhibit, ex I'll get, I'm trying to do two words at one time. Ex exhibited and exalted. Yes, okay. If you know what I'm trying to say, just say amen. amen. Good, we'll move on. All right. Isn't it great to be in God's house today? It's a beautiful day outside, even though it is a little warm for December. But God is going to warm our hearts with His Word. In 1 John 4, in verse 10, beginning there, um, it's interesting. It says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son, an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, what God has done for us is amazing. The fact that he even wanted to do it is amazing. But I want you to jump back to verse 7. It's where we actually picked up and began last week, but I want to include it this morning. Would you follow in verse 7 with me? Dear friends, John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who has been born of God knows God. Whoever does not lo love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how we how God showed us His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. Are you catching this? God sent His Son that we, as Christian, as believers, might live through Christ. Today we talk about Christ being in us, 
And so we also want to understand that we want Christ to live through us, not just in us. Being in us would be like having a whole jar of change that you saved up for Christmas to buy a gift, and then Christmas came and went, you just left it in the jar. And the next year, you left it in the jar. And the next year, you left it in the jar. It, having it does not do you any good unless you allow it to be used. In verse 9, it goes on to say, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 11, Dear friends, since God loved us so, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete or perfected in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, I want to thank you for your word today. Heavenly Father, I have enjoyed feasting on it all week as I have uh, laid this message out, but Lord, it's just been a wonderful time for you and me to talk. But Father, now it's time to share that word. And so rather than you just speaking to me, as you have, uh, God, I'm just asking you to speak to all of our hearts concerning your word today, concerning having confidence in God in our lives. And Father, have your way today as we worship you together. Let us take away from this spiritual table this morning a feast that we carry with us not only into the day but throughout the week that we apply it to our lives. And God, we give you the praise and the glory for what you're doing this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, Amen. The Holy Spirit of God inspired John the Apostle to give us three declarative statements about the nature of God. John writes this, but he doesn't just confine it to the letters of 1 John. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 5, we read that God is light. In John 4, chapter 4, verse 24, we read that God is a spirit. He's spirit. And here in verse 8 of 1 John chapter 4, we read, God is love. When we comprehend and contemplate the fact that a holy God loves a sinful world, our hearts should be filled with gratitude. We can never know enough about God. Amen? We're always learners. It reminds me of the grandmother uh, that said to her granddaughter, Hannah, tomorrow we're going to Sunday school. And Hannah replied, I don't like Sunday school. Her grandmother said, we need to learn about God's love. And Hannah replied, I learned enough about it. Her mother said, I've been going to church all my life and I haven't learned enough. To which Hannah replied, weren't you paying attention, Grandma? You know, we do need to pay attention, but we really need to go to Sunday school. We need to go to Bible study. We need to worship together collectively as a body of Christ. While the love of friends and family may fail you, God's love will never fail. As you walk with God in this life, you can always be confident of Christ's love in you. You can be confident of it because the love of God is proclaimed. Now look at verse 7 and 8 again. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. He is telling us here, as he writes this to the church in Galatia, that <clears throat> he's proclaiming the truth of God's love. Now the world likes to buy into this and say, God is love, therefore he wouldn't send anybody to hell. Well, it's interesting how many people, according to a recent survey by Barna Group, say that uh, they believe in heaven. And I think it's something like maybe 70%. I don't remember the exact number. And then when asked how many people believe in hell, only about 28 to 30% believe in hell. And yet when people want to rationalize God's love and say God wouldn't send anybody to hell, it seems like they all agree on that. But let me tell you this, God does not send anyone to hell. He does not pick somebody out and say, oh, you're just bad, you're going to hell. Because it's not your performance in life that determines whether you go to heaven or you go to hell after you die. But it is your relationship with Jesus Christ and what you have done with him while you're on this earth 
while you have opportunity to make the choice. So God, Paul proclaims God's love to the people in Galatia. Notice in verse 7, love comes from God. In verse 8, God is love. You see, we cannot love God except that he loved us first. It is not man's capability to just say, I des I've decided that I'm just going to love God and determine that you are and decide when and where you're going to love God. The truth of it is, the only reason we love God is because we've experienced his love to us first. We experienced it when he allowed his son to come to earth from heaven to die on the cross through his suffering and to be raised again into new life, to take the keys of death and hell away from Satan, where he no longer has the authority over it, and then to come back and give the message to the disciples to preach the gospel that Jesus has risen. He is alive. You see, we just don't talk about the resurrection on Easter, but we talk about Easter all year long, amen? Because the fact that Jesus has raised from the dead is the good news. It's what we need to proclaim today, that God loves each person unconditionally, as good or bad as that person may be, with all the defects and the, the profects or perfection that a person might have in their life, God says, I just love you all the same. Say, well, now wait a minute, preacher. What about the guy down here, the street here, who hates God, says he curses God, lives his own life, and has nothing to do with God? Jesus came and died for him. Jesus came and died for her also. You see, it doesn't matter if it's the worst person you can think about, and that was the only person on the face of the earth, Jesus would have come and died for that soul because he is his creation. He loves us all equally and sacrificially. God's nature is a loving nature. He's that way. He is love. He doesn't just manifest love. The Bible says he is love. Love's origin is found in God. God is not soft or indulgent, though, towards sin, but he loves the sinner. He loves the saint. Did I mention he loves everybody? Every one of us. This is a new concept for many in the first century because the pagan deities were feared, and they uh, shook in their boots when they thought about the God that they worshiped because they always pictured that God as one who's out to get you or he'll hurt you if you do wrong or do something oh, uh, in contrast to what he tells you to do. You see, paganism has no hope at all. They serve an inanimate God that they form in the shape of an idol, and that's why we don't build idols anymore. We don't want to appear to be pagan. That's why in the Protestant church we don't have pictures um, simulated of Jesus hanging around. We don't put crosses on the wall with Jesus hanging on the cross because he's not on the cross anymore. We do not make statues of Jesus or anybody else. We take all of these pagan related things and it's not that you're a pagan if you have one, but it's we don't want to draw our attention to anything other than, not in replica, not an image, but only put your attention on God himself. You say, well, I can't see him. Yes, you can. Look in the Bible. Look at Jesus. Look at what he did, who he is, what he said, his nature, his character, and you will see God. Because Jesus himself said, you've seen me, then you've seen God. Amen? And truly, Jesus is God. Now, I don't know how long God's hair is. I don't know what color it is. I don't know what attire he may be wearing, and it doesn't matter about all those things. What matters is that I see the character, the nature, the actions, the attitudes, the behavior of Jesus Christ, and I see that, I formulate that in my mind, and that's what I desire. I desire him, the person of God. The Bible says, Paul wrote this in Corinthians, he says, now we see in a mirror dimly or darkly, but then, when we get to heaven, we're going to see face to face. We couldn't stand that encounter right now. It would kill us. Moses never looked straight on God, but Moses always bowed his face down. Moses, even when, when God passed by him, he hid in the cleft of a rock, the Bible says, and, and let God's presence pass by because he is so holy. 
that we in this physical form could not look on him. God is awesome. He is love, but he is also not tolerant of sin. God's people are characterized by God's love because God is love. So we should emulate that, uh, that characteristic. Sometimes love must be stormy, though. Paul told Timothy in preaching to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. But even our rebuke must be motivated by love. You see, we're not to pound somebody over the head with God's word. We're not to be a Bible thumper and, and beat them up because they're not Christian or they're not perfect. Um, by the way, if you're perfect, I want to go ahead and excuse you from the message you've already attained. So, you know, you don't, in fact, come up here and preach to us. Amen. And none of us are there. I'm only privileged because God called me to do that. Not that I'm perfect, not that I got it all together, but simply because God has called me to do this. My question maybe this morning for you is what has God called you to do? Certainly we know he's called you to be a witness, Matthew 28, into all the world, wherever you live, wherever you go. But he's also called you to sacrifice for the cause of Christ, for the good of the gospel and the kingdom of God. But God's people, since we are characterized by love, we must exhibit that love always, no matter what we're doing. If we're rebuking, correcting, teaching, it doesn't matter. It should all be done in love. Let us vote on the color of the carpet in love, amen, and not have dissension. <clears throat> I want to tell you, there was um, there's an encounter. When we're born... We take on a physical nature, don't we? I mean, when you're born, you, you are a little baby. Uh, you start growing. Immediately, you have fleshly desires like to eat. I think that's the only instinct that a baby has is to eat. And a cry. I meant to throw that one in. Uh, but we have physical needs and physical characteristics, just like our physical parents. For instance, my dad, my biological father, was um, tall. He, I wasn't, I'm not quite as tall as he was. But he had this Cherokee Indian nose on him that wouldn't quit. I got one, too. He passed it right on to me. And this slanted forehead, I got that, too. So I have characteristics of my physical, biological dad. And um, in the same way, I have characteristics of my heavenly Father now that I've come to Christ. And so what does that mean? What does that look like in the life of a Christian? Well, the way we see that is in the life of a Christian, we see the character of our heavenly Father, the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We see the attributes that are in His life, the attitudes, the behavior, the likes, the dislikes. We see them all in our heavenly Father, and guess what? They, need to, they should be reflected in our own life because the very spirit of the living God, who is God, just as much as Jesus is God, lives inside of every believer. That's a promise straight from Scripture, that he comes and resides in us, not only to give us power and all, but to be a witness to us that we are children of God. He is there in residence. And if you're saying, well, I've never experienced him in my life, then... You need to do some soul searching and say, God, I put my faith in you and I, I, I was baptized, and which is just a following. It's not a saving factor, but my faith in you saved me and I've, I've done some things. I followed you in baptism and I attend church and I, I'm in Sunday school and I read the Bible, but Lord, I'm missing something. I'm missing hearing you. Has anybody ever been in that boat? I'm missing hearing you. But because God loves us so much, He really wants to speak to us directly. You know, I've told some people, this Christians, I mean even Baptists, that, uh, you know, about times that God has spoken to me directly, and they're like, wow, I wish He'd do that with me. And I mean, one time a preacher told me that, and, and I was kind of taken back. But I started realizing that there, there are Christians who love God and are saved and do not hear from God. Now, God speaks to us in several ways. He does speak to us audibly when He wants to, and I must admit that's not an everyday occurrence, but it has happened several times in my life where I've 
hello, where, I look around for where God is. I mean, uh, one time I was driving down the road in my truck, and it was so real that I looked over in the seat next to me to see him because that's how it sounded to me. But God doesn't need a physical eardrum to speak to you, does he? He can speak directly to our spirits because he is there in us. So consequently, because of his love, we, are, we exhibit the character of God. And if he's not, <clears throat> excuse me, if God's not speaking to you audibly, then you need to look for God to speak to you through his word. That's why he gave it to us. And if, if you don't see God speaking to you or answering your questions or addressing whatever you're praying about uh, in his word specifically, then look for him to answer in circumstances of life that are around you or in testimony of, from other believers in the body of Christ. Because God does communicate to us on many different levels and in different ways. Because he loves us. So even though we're born physically and have physical characteristics of our biological parents, it's nothing compared to the spiritual characteristics we should have of our Heavenly Father. So we see that God's love is proclaimed in his word and it's proclaimed by his people. You can be confident of God's love because God's love is proved. It's proved. If you look at verse 9 and 10, it says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God proved to you that he loves you by sacrificing his son Jesus, on the cross, to pay for our sin debt. Someone has mentioned from time to time that, um, well, you know, after you get saved, and we talked about this in our Bible study class this morning, that we are saved through faith, or by grace through faith in Christ. And anyone who tells you, well, we're saved by grace through, fra uh, through faith, and now, listen, you got to be good. Anybody ever told you that? Has anybody ever thought that? Now that I'm saved, I got to be good. Let's be honest. I got to be good. Well, you know that you can't do it on your own. You may try and you will fail just as I have tried and failed in the past. And I came to the point where I told God I can't do this. And he said, you're right, you can't. But I can in you. In fact, Philippians says that I talked to talking about us. I can do all things through Christ, not in my own self, by my own talent or my own desires, but it's through Christ. Well, God manifested his love, and manifest simply means that he, uh, his love became visible to us. Well, how did his love become visible in a person of Jesus Christ? When Jesus walked on this earth, we saw God's love in action. Today, Jesus is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he's given us his Holy Spirit. And today, love is, God's love is manifested not through Jesus' actions, but through ours. And my question is to all of us, does my life show Jesus' love? Or does my life look like a roller coaster with Jesus and sometimes I'm on and sometimes I'm off? Some days are good and some days are bad. You know, I'm afraid that a lot of times that's what our life looks like. It looks like we do good one day and then the next day we kind of mess up. I did real good one day and then the next day I had one nerve left and somebody got on it, amen? <laughs> and they, they pressed that button and I went off. And all of a sudden, I'm not acting like my heavenly father. I'm acting like my old father, the devil. Well, God gave us his only begotten son. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. God gave by offering his son as a sacrifice for our sins. By the way, might I say once and for all, according to Romans. He offered him once and for all, according to Hebrews. He offered him once and for all. One time on the cross for all what? All people and all sin. All sin was paid for on the cross. That does not mean that all people are going to heaven. 
it means that all sin debt was paid once and for all, but only those who come to God God's way will experience eternal life and the forgiveness of those sins. It's kind of like when I was a kid, uh, we had a store in uh, Southern California called Safeway. And my mom and dad, um, we were not real well off. We had a nice roof over our head. You know, we had a car. But um, we were the kind of folks that if you could get some coupons from the store, anybody remember coupons from the grocery store? Uh, that we would, we would save those. And mom wanted a waffle iron. We didn't have waffle. All we were a pancake family. We never had a waffle. And we wanted a waffle iron. Mom's heart was set on a waffle iron. So dad, every time we went to the store, that little machine had spit out those stamps, S&H green stamps. He'd take them, and when we got home, he'd paste them in that book, just religiously. And listen, dad, you remember the big gr brown grocery bags? Two and a half grocery bags he was shooting for. That was the goal, because that's what it took to get a waffle iron. A lot of stamps, a lot of waiting, a lot of purchasing. And one day, we had two and a half bags of books of S&H green stamps all stacked in there tight and everything. And, and now we had all we needed for the waffle iron. But did we have the waffle iron? No. Those bags of S&H green stamps were sitting in our living room. So we had to get the waffle iron. We had to load them up and go down to the store and present them, listen to me, and redeem the waffle iron. We traded the, the bags of stamps for the waffle iron. Jesus did the same thing. God offered him on the cross for the forgiveness and the redemption of mankind for his sins. And because of that, God redeemed us back. We are the waffle iron, hallelujah. We are the prize. We are God's heart. He loved you enough to send his son and redeem you back to himself reestablish the relationship with, that was lost by sin in the Garden of Eden. That's what Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit have done for us. Well, God gave His Son as that sacrifice. And Jesus is the righteousness of God revealed to us in Christ. Long before Joseph Smith concocted Mormonism and denied the deity of Jesus Christ, long before Russellites invented the Jehovah's Witness cults, God himself, in the person of Christ, became the, became the only acceptable payment for sin. It's only through Christ's atoning work that we can be saved and the penalty of our sins be paid for. But he did something else. He became, and this is one of those $25 seminary words. You don't have to write it down, because unless you practice, you probably can't spell it well. He became the propitiation the propitiation. Look at verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He came to pay your sin debt. How many of you are glad of that? You know, you can't go to heaven without Jesus coming and paying the debt because you can't pay the debt. That's why men and women, boys and girls, Anybody who is at an age where they can rash, uh, understand and recognize what God has done for them, if they reject what Jesus has done, then although Jesus paid the price, they've rejected it. They've not gone back to the grocery store and redeemed anything. They are lost. So God does not send the people to hell. We are on our way when we're born because we have a sin nature. We're on the superhighway to hell, if you will. But Jesus came, and he established an off-ramp. Everybody know the interstate and what an off-ramp is. What happens when you are on the highway and you get off the off-ramp? Do you go farther? Do you end up in Mobile if you're traveling east? No, you don't, because you've taken an exit. And Jesus Christ is the exit that we all need to take to get off the highway to hell. And it's only by grace through our faith in what Christ has done that we can take that off-ramp today. He came to pay our sin debt. It's the only payment that would satisfy God's wrath towards sin. Someone asked, why did he do this? Well, because God is just. 
Sin must be judged. Amen? It must go to court, and it's going to be found guilty. But what Jesus did in the courtroom that you would stand in is Christ came in between you and the judge as an intercessor, as an advocate. He stepped in between, and he took the penalty that you were going to have to take. So instead of you going to hell, Christ, when he died on the cross, went and took the keys of death and hell from Satan. And that's something even Baptists can shout about. Amen? So what he did is he paid the price, and only Christ is sufficient to pay that price. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 says this, that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in this forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. You see, before Jesus came, all the Old Testament saints that put their trust in the one Jehovah, Yahweh, God, did not, when they died, there were two places, paradise and hell at that point. And when those who had believed, on, believed in God, the one true God, when they passed away, they went into a holding tank for heaven called paradise. But those who had not embraced the one true God went to a place called hell. In the Greek, it's Tartarus. It is simply the holding tank of the wicked dead until the day that hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire, as we read in uh, Revelation. Well, you know, let me give you an example of propitiation. A 30-year-old mother was discovered to have advanced stages of terminal cancer. One doctor advised her to spend her remaining days on vacation, live it up, do everything she wanted to do, complete her bucket list. A second physician offered her hope of living two to four more years, but with grueling side effects of radiation. And she pinned the following words to her three small children. I have chosen to endure the treatments for you. This has some horrible costs, including pain, loss of good humor, and moods I won't be able to control. But I must do this if only on the outside chance that I might live one minute longer, and that minute could be the one that you need me most when no one else will do. Listen, when Jesus offered himself on that cross, he offered himself as the only source, the only one that we're going to need, and when nobody else will do. You see, there are no other ways to heaven. There are no lots of roads, as Ophrah might tell us that there are many ways to get to God. There is only one way, and that's through the person, Jesus Christ. How many of you know that? One way through the person of Christ. Amen. He has paid it all for us. So as we recognize what propitiation is, we also need to recognize that our confidence in God is produced by God's love, and it's practiced. It's practice for us. Look at verse 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, God's action is loving us, and His command for us is to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete or manifest in us. You see, we practice God's love by loving one another, as we see in verse 11. Love for one another is the evidence that the Holy Spirit lives in us and that we are children of God. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is a real person? He's not some inanimate force to be spoken of that way. He's not an it. He is the person of God in us in the form of a spirit. And so when we look at this, we see that as we allow Him to be manifest in our life, as we allow Him to bear fruit in our life, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 and 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and patience and kindness. And Paul goes on to say, <clears throat> about which there is no law. There's no law against these things because they come from God and they are a manifestation of the Spirit in your life. Now, I know some people who are not Christians do not have the Holy Spirit in their life, and they have done some really good things. You know some like that, too. 
We call them good old boys or good old girls, but they don't have Christ. But the difference is that they're producing this on their own effort. But when a Christian allows the Spirit of God to manifest himself through us, it's not us producing these good things, love, joy, peace, or whatever. It's the Spirit of God doing it. And when God's Spirit does it, it has eternal value and eternal merit. I remember one time I saw a worker on the side of the road, been years ago, and he had a swing blade. Y'all remember the swing blades he used to cut grass with on the highway? Well, I mean, it's only been about 35 years ago, but I remember he had a swing blade, and I thought, good grief, a swing blade? Where's a weed eater, you know? And he had a swing blade cutting the grass in the median. And I thought, man, it is 95 degrees out here. And so I was headed down the road, and I knew there was a convenience store down there, so I turned in, got a soda, went back, made the loop, came back around, and stopped on a road and rolled the window down and handed him that Coke. And I said, you just look like you needed a Coke, something cold to drink. And he said, wow, thank you, you know, and I drove off. And that was a good thing. That was good fruit, but I did it out of my own might. But when the Holy Spirit of the living God brings love, it's a love, not like I produce, but it's a love of God that God produces. It's, it's a love that can love the unlovables, the people that live on the other side of the track. That kind of love. The people that have hurt you and done you wrong. That kind of love. I can't do that. I can't imitate that love. Only God can produce that kind of love. The, the love that is found in the church, <clears throat> where church members are looking for the benefit to the benefit of other church members rather than to themselves. It's where we love one another and we sacrifice our own Will, finances, ways, attitude, whatever it is, we sacrifice for the benefit and the blessing of others. That's the kind of love that the Holy Spirit produces, and that cannot be imitated by the world. <clears throat> I shouldn't say that. It, it can be falsified by the world, but it doesn't hold up. Do you understand what I'm saying? When, when it's put to the fire, it's, it's going to burn up. But only the love of Christ produced by the Holy Spirit in our life passes all the acid tests. So as we love one another, his love is perfected in us. In verse 12, we see that. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. If God lives in us, his love is made complete. What does that mean? Well, I had to think about that a little bit. I said, what does God's complete love look like in the life of a believer? And what I started realizing is that what it looks like is that when someone hurts me, I don't retaliate, but I respond with love and kindness and gentleness and understanding that that person's having a bad hair day or whatever it might be. And if you say, well, it's not a bad hair day, Brother Stan, they're like this all the time and they say they're a Christian, then guess what? My responsibility is to pray for them that God would reveal what they're doing to them and show them that that's not Christ-like. It's not God-like. And so the Holy Spirit is perfected in us, and His work perfected, really, that work could also be translated, it's completed in us. In other words, it's, it's brought out all of the uh, manifestation of the Holy Spirit that God wants in our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, all these things. It's... It's made complete. <clears throat> Everything that God wants us to do and exhibit to the world comes as fruit from the Holy Spirit that's in us. Listen, as we yield our lives to God, it does not happen when we're walking in the flesh. It does not happen when we're doing our own thing and saying, well, I'll do God's thing Sunday when I go to church. But God wants to allow, he wants his Holy Spirit to manifest complete love through us, and he can only do that when we are submitting our will and our desires and everything about us, when we lay our lives on the spiritual altar and say, God, here I am. You created me, you redeemed me, you saved me from a devil's hell, and my life is yours. If that's your attitude daily, 
then God's Holy Spirit can manifest and complete all those wonderful things in your life that the world will see. And here's the ultimate end of all of this. As the world sees God in your life, they give God glory. And that's what God wants from you. He wants this produced in your life so that everyone will give him glory. Not you, not me. It's not because of us. You know, somebody pats us on the back. I almost want to say, don't pat me. Just say, thank you, Lord. You know, we got to... We got to learn to allow someone to pat us on the back sometimes. That was hard for me when I get in ministry. But you know, it's okay as long as we have the right attitude about that. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the compliment. Uh, amen. And I thank God for allowing it to happen, making it happen. God's love is proclaimed in the Word. It's proved at the cross. And it's perfected in your life. Every Christian has the ability to love everyone because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We are to practice His love. It's what brings glory to God through our lives. You know, you might have heard of G. Campbell Morgan. He was one of the famous uh, British preachers in the past. And one day he was having lunch with his wife and five preacher sons. Can you see this picture? And um, <clears throat> one of the friends, friends of his, saw him in a restaurant and came over to him and he he looked at all these preachers here and he said, which one of you in this family is the greatest preacher? And every one of them looked at their mother and pointed and said, she is. <laughs> you see, the fruit of the Spirit is exhibited in our life and really has a manifestation and an effect on everybody, doesn't it? So the only reason there's any good in us at all is because of God and what He has done. We preach the gospel... <clears throat> as we become yielded vessels to the Holy Spirit, loving God, loving one another more than ourselves. Let me, let me close this morning and, and bring this to a head. God proclaimed His love for you through His nature. He sacrificed Himself for your sake through Christ on the cross. God proved His love for you when He gave His only Son that you might live. And God practices His love through yielded vessels. You are to practice His love by loving one another. Is that always easy? Certainly not. I mean, sometimes people may have trouble loving us because we operate in the flesh sometimes. And we need to, we really need to make up our mind that God I don't want to operate in the flesh anymore. I don't want to do X, Y, or Z, and you just fill in the blank there that you're, you do sometimes in your life is I have to think about what I do in my life sometimes and say, God, I don't want that to be part of my life anymore. It's not a good representation of who my God is. It's not a good manifestation of your Holy Spirit. And so I have to learn, I have to yield to be able to practice godliness.